So heat, right? As we said earlier, heat is the energy flow between two systems due to a temperature difference. So this is what happens when your system and surroundings are not in thermal equilibrium. So it has, has to be associated with putting two things that are not at the same temperature. So Q is a commonly used symbol for heat. Now, if heat flows into the system, okay, then we say that the system absorbed heat or that the process is endothermic. Okay. And by convention, we assign a positive value for Q. So the value of Q is the amount of heat flow, and whether it's positive or, or negative depends on whether heat flowed into the system or out of the system. Okay. It's the amount of energy that flows into or out of your system through heat flow, okay? All right. So if heat flows out of your system, then you say your system has released heat, and so the process we say is exothermic. Q is assigned a negative value. So we check. Pot of water at room temperature is placed on a hot stove. 5,000 calories of heat is transferred. Q for the pot of water is blank, and Q for the stove is blank. What happens here? Let's assume the water is cold for room temperature. It's a hot stove. So. Q for the pot of water is positive. Right? It flowed into the water. And Q for the stove would be negative. So if we take the pot of water as our system, then we say Q is positive 5,000 calories. If you take the stove as our system, then you say Q is going to be negative 5,000 calories. Right. How do you measure Q? Well, assuming there's no chemical or phase change, heat flow causes a change in temperature. Okay? So, uh, uh, if heat flow causes a change in temperature, then the amount of temperature change is going to be directly proportional to the heat that uh, flowed into or out of your system. Okay, so we define heat as directly proportional to the temperature change. The larger the temperature change, the larger the Q. Okay, the proportionality constant here is C, it's called the heat capacity. Yeah, I have it right here. C is the heat capacity of the system. So you can define C then. We can rearrange this. You can say C is equal to Q divided by delta T. So that's the amount of heat that would have to flow to cause a change of one degree Celsius or one Kelvin. So the unit for heat capacity is joules per Kelvin or joules per degree Celsius. Okay. Uh, units for heat are calories abbreviated as CAL or joules, J. One calorie is 4.184 joules. Now, in general, heat capacity actually does depend on temperature. So instead of saying Q equals C delta T, from now on, you will say that Q is equal to the integral of C dT from T initial T final. Why is that? Well, let's, uh, let's just plot C versus T. What happens if C is constant? What would the plot look like? It's going to be a horizontal line, right? It's not going to change. So if you want to go from, let's say, T1 to T2, okay? So what's our delta T then? This is our delta T, right? T2 minus T1. And so that's the width. And this height right here of your rectangle is just C, right? So C times delta T is just the area of that triangle, of that rectangle. Q is C delta T. That's just the area of the rectangle. But what if C depends on temperature? What would you get? Let's say C versus T. Let's say it looks like that. Well, you can imagine splitting this up into little rectangles, right? So imagine these 
a small change in delta t. So this is almost a rectangle right there, right? So if they call that dt, that, that the width of that, and the height is going to be c at, at this temperature, so c of t over here. So that area of that little rectangle would be CDT. Okay. So if you add up all of those little rectangles there, take a sum of all of those, and take the limit as delta T becomes very DT becomes very very small. What's, what's the area under a curve? From calculus, that's just the integral. So integral of CDT from T initial to T1 to T2, T initial to T final, that would be your Q. All right, so that, that would be a more general formula for Q if your heat capacity happens to depend on temperature. So let's say your C, okay, generally you might be able to find heat capacity tabulated as A plus BT plus CT, C over T squared, for example where you can look up A, B, and C uh, for a given uh, substance. So what would be my Q in this case if I were to, let's say, change my temperature from T1 to T2? It's going to be integral of C, D, T. So integral of A plus B, T plus C over T squared, D, T, from T1 to T2. And what's that integral equal to? What's the integral of A, D, T? A, B, and C are constants. So what's the integral of this? It's going to be A, T plus what's the integral of B, T, D, T? B T squared over two, right? And what's the integral of C D T over T squared? Integral of C it's C T to the negative two D T. What do you got? what do you have to do to get an integral? That's going to be C T to the negative 2 plus 1 over negative 2 plus 1, right? So that's going to be, this is going to be negative 1 down here, negative C over T. T to the negative 1 is 1 over T, okay? So, uh, that's the integral, and you evaluate it from T1 to T2. So that's going to be A times delta T, right? T2 minus T1 plus B over 2 times T2 squared minus T1 squared. Right? Now, now, note that this is not, this is not the same as delta T squared. Okay, this is delta of t squared. The change in t squared is not is not the same as the square of delta t. All right. Plus, what's the last term? Negative c over t. So negative c one over t two minus one over t one. Let's, let's review some simple examples of freshman chemistry. Uh, it takes 8.4 times 10 to the third joules of heat to raise the temperature of a sample of water from 25 to 35 degrees Celsius plus the heat capacity. You'll notice here, you're just assuming that heat capacity, without any additional information, you can just assume that the heat capacity is independent of temperature. Okay, now, uh, your book does have a table of heat capacities, and it does show in some the dependence of heat capacity on temperature. So you, if you really want to solve this correctly, you'll have to look up how the heat capacity of water depends on temperature. Um, sorry. 
No, I got that reversed. This is just just heating the. In this particular case, you just need to get the average heat capacity over that temperature. Okay, so we're assuming that you have a constant heat capacity, and this is usually a good approximation to make if you're dealing with a narrow temperature case. So it's just a few degrees. You can more or less assume heat capacity is constant. So what will be the answer to this? Heat capacity is. Q divided by delta T. So that's our Q. 8.4 times 10 to the third joules divided by delta T is 10.0 Kelvin. 10 degrees Celsius is the same as 10 Kelvin in terms of changes. So that's going to be 8.4 times 10 to the 2 joules per Kelvin. Okay. Heat capacity of a metal is 25 joules per Kelvin. Calculate Q if its temperature drops from 20 to 16 degrees. First of all, which ones can you eliminate right away? What should Q be? Temperature drops, 20 to 16, so heat flow in or out of the system? Out, so exothermic, so what's, so what values of Q can you eliminate? A and C, we expect Q to be negative, so what's our Q in this case? It's just going to be C delta T, which is assuming heat capacity is constant. What's our heat capacity? 25.0 joules per Kelvin, and our temperature change is 20 minus 16 minus 20, so it's negative 4.0 Kelvin. Right? So 25 times negative 4 is negative 100, two sig figs, so negative 1.0 times 10 to the 2 joules. Kelvin cancels out. D. Specific heat. Anytime you see the word specific written in front of a quantity or use as an adjective, that means per gram. So a specific heat capacity is heat capacity per gram. Now oftentimes specific heat capacity is just referred to as the specific heat. Okay? That's the same thing. So if you know the specific heat, you simply multiply them, multiply it by the mass to get the heat capacity. So heat capacity per gram times the actual number of grams that gives you the heat capacity. Specific heat times mass gives you heat capacity. Now specific heats are the ones that are available from tables. You can look it up. You can't look up heat capacities, but what you they're usually given on a per gram basis because you can't just list the heat capacity for every sample every different mass of sample, right? So you, it's only given to you uh, for us. Uh, and it's also available only for homogeneous samples. Why is that? Yeah, if your sample is not homogeneous, then different parts of your sample will have different specific heats, different heat capacities, right? So specific heat uh, has to be for a homogeneous sample. So um, the molar heat capacity Anytime you see the word molar in front of a quantity, that means per mole. So specific something means per gram, something per gram. Spe molar something would be something per mole. So molar heat capacity, C sub M, is the heat capacity per mole. So if you can look up the molar heat capacity, then you simply multiply that by the number of moles that gives you the heat capacity. Now molar heat capacities are only available for pure substances. Okay, and again, uh, why is that? Because you have to specify per mole of what, right? And so, it's only available for pure substances. Heat capacity of 200 grams of iron is 90 joules per Kelvin. What's the specific heat and what's the molar heat capacity? Heat capacity is 90.0 joules per Kelvin. What's our specific heat? 
what symbol did we use for specific heat? We didn't use a symbol. Let's use C sub S for specific heat, okay? What would that be? 90.0 joules per Kelvin divided by 200.0 grams. And so what's the number? 90 divided by 200. Point four five zero joules per Kelvin per gram. Okay. What's the molar heat capacity? C sub n. How many grams per mole? So you just say point four five zero joules per Kelvin per gram. It's another way of writing the unit times how many grams per mole for iron? Molar mass of iron. So 55.845 grams per mole. So that cancels out grams. And that is how much? 25.1 joules per Kelvin per mole. Specific heat of water is 4.18 joules per Kelvin per gram of molar heat capacity of water. How do we set up the problem here? They say 4.18 joules per Kelvin per gram. So what's my conversion factor? 18.02 grams per mole. Cancel. So molar heat capacity of water is... Joules per Kelvin. Okay. Now, the molar heat capacity of a solid metallic element is approximately equal to 3R at room temperature. This is known as the law of Dulong and Petit. So, if you want to estimate the molar, the specific heat of um, the specific heat of a metallic element, you can say that the molar heat capacity is 3R, so just change it to per gram. So in the case of iron, what would it be? What's 3R? 3 times 8.314 joules per Kelvin per mole is how much? 8.314. Twenty four point nine four two okay joules per Kelvin per mole. So let's change that to per gram. So twenty four point nine four joules per Kelvin per mole. How many grams per mole in iron? So one mole over fifty five point. 55.845. So 55.845, and that gives you how much? 0.446 joules per Kelvin per gram. And you can see that's very close to the number we had earlier. Okay. The actual specific heat of iron is 0.45. Can see that the molar heat capacity is about 25. So that's a good number to remember. 3R is about 25, right? In joules per Kelvin. 
So that's a good number to remember. It's about 25 joules per Kelvin. So if you want to estimate it's two sig figs, 25 joules per Kelvin is the molar heat capacity. Alright. Alright. Uh, specific heat of water is 4.18 joules per Kelvin per gram. Specific heat of iron is 0.45 joules per Kelvin per gram. Which one releases more heat if cooled from 100 degrees to 37 degrees? In other words, if I were to ask you to touch iron that's 100, 100 degrees and or water at 100 degrees, which one would you prefer to touch so you don't get burned as much? <laughs> None of the above. <laughs> but how much, which one releases more heat? Q is equal to one. Mass times specific heat times delta T, right? Mass times specific heat is just the heat capacity. Well, we have the same mass, so we just compare specific heat. We're looking at the same delta T, right? From 100 to 37. The one with the higher specific heat, water. Water will burn more than iron. 100 degrees. Okay, why did I select 37 degrees here? That's your body temperature, 37. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So one thing you'll notice about water is, okay, it releases more heat. Okay, for, for a small temperature change. That also means if you want to warm up water, it requires more heat to get its temperature to change. Okay. So uh, what that's, uh, in fact, you'll notice the specific heat of water is much, about 10, at least 10 times, uh, about 10 times higher, uh, 44.45, I said. At least eight times higher than iron, right? Water has an unusually high specific heat. That's what makes it a very good, a very good coolant. It can absorb a lot of heat without changing its temperature very much. That's why water is used is the best, it's the best coolant, it's the universal coolant. Okay, because of unusual, it's unusually high specific heat. Metals typically like iron, uh, typically around 0.5, so around that. So. But it doesn't take long to heat up, doesn't take much heat to raise the temperature of a, of a piece of metal. Okay? And you've experienced that when you, when you use a metal, metallic spoon, right? Well, there's conductivity involved there too. But no. Now, one reason where uh, if you live in a region where, you live, where you're near a very large body of water, that's one reason why, one reason where, why the temperature would not change drastically overnight. Whereas if you live in a desert where there isn't much water, you see much drastic changes in temperature. That has to do with the uh, effect of the water. It takes much more energy to change the temperature of water. Okay, now heat capacity actually depends on the conditions that you're dealing with when you are doing the heating or the cooling. Okay, what we've been assuming so far and that's what we've been, what's what's been what has been assumed in your freshman chemistry classes is you're doing all your heating open in in situations where you're, it's open to the atmosphere, so it's a constant pressure. So most of what we've been talking so far, uh, uh, implicit in those is the assumption that the heating was done at constant pressure. It actually does make a difference. Okay, what the conditions were when you do, what the conditions are when you're, when the temperature changes by heating, okay? So heat capacity at constant pressure, we usually give it the symbol C sub P. The P here means that's a constant pressure. The heat capacity would be different if you're going to heat something at constant volume. So if you're going to constrain the volume to a constant value while you're heating something, then the amount of heat uh, that would be required to raise its temperature by one degree or one, one Kelvin is going to be different. In general, heat capacity at constant pressure is going to be larger than the heat capacity at constant volume. In fact, it's significantly different for gases. If you have an ideal gas, okay, one way you could define, in fact, an ideal gas is to say that the heat capacity of an ideal gas at constant pressure 
is higher than its heat capacity at constant volume by an amount equal to nR, where n is the number of moles of gas and R is uh, the ideal gas constant. You'll notice that unit for R is, what's the unit for R? Joule per Kelvin per mole, right? It's the same unit as molar heat capacity. So if you have an ideal gas, the difference between the specific the heat capacities of the gas at constant pressure and at constant volume is nR. So heat capacity at constant pressure is much is higher by an amount equal to nR. Now if you're dealing with oops, this should be solids and liquids. Okay. Then your heat capacity would be more or less the same whether you're doing it at constant pressure or constant volume. Okay, heat capacity at constant pressure would generally still be higher than the heat capacity of constant volume, but they're very they're going to be very similar. So the question is, why is the heat capacity at constant pressure higher than the heat capacity at constant volume? Well, the thing is, if you allow your system, if you're doing a constant pressure, heating, okay? If you heat your sample at constant pressure, the change in temperature will generally also lead to expansion. So heating will generally lead to expansion, a change in volume at constant pressure. So if there's going to be a change in volume, what's our delta V going to be, a positive number or a negative number? So if we're going to increase our, our temperature, right? At constant pressure, delta V is going to be a positive number. Right? The system will expand. Well, if the system expands, that means it's expanding against a constant external pressure. So it's going to be doing what's called PV work. We talked about pressure volume work earlier. What's our PV work equal to? The magnitude of that is P external times delta V, right? So part of the energy you're putting in, okay, part of the energy you're putting in doesn't, uh, part of the energy you're putting in has to be spit back out, so to speak, by doing work. Remember, when something is expanding, it's doing work. So it's releasing energy to the surroundings in the form of work. So not all of the energy you're putting in is used to raise the temperature. So you'd have to put more energy in, we have to put more heat in in order to cause the same temperature change at constant pressure. Okay? Because part of the energy you're putting in at constant pressure is used to do expansion work. So that's why your heat capacity at constant pressure is higher than the heat capacity of constant volume. Okay. An ideal monatomic gas is a molar heat capacity at constant volume of 3 halves R. What's the molar heat capacity of neon? Then? You can ask, assume neon is an ideal gas, so heat capacity at constant pressure is how much? Well, what's heat capacity at constant volume first? C sub V is 3, 3 halves R. So 3 halves times 8.314. Oops. Joules per Kelvin per mole. That's our CV. What would that be? That's about 25 divided by 2, so 12 point something. What's the answer? Twelve point four seven joules per Kelvin per mole. What's our CP? It's just equal to CV plus NR, right? So if you want to do this per mole, by the way, if you want to say it's per mole, you can put a bar on top, okay, of the symbol, or you can put comma M after C, after the symbol, so as a subscript. So that's molar heat capacity. 
So what's the molar heat capacity at constant pressure? Cv is how much? Okay, so if I make this per mole, so Cv per mole, what's N if it's per mole? One mole, right? So uh, what would that be? In other words, Cp per mole is just equal to Cv per mole plus R. Okay, if we're doing everything on a per mole basis, then N is 1. So Cp per mole is, what's our Cv? 12.47 joules per Kelvin per mole. Last, what's our R? 8.314 joules per Kelvin per mole. And that gives you how much? Point seven eight joules per Kelvin per mole. What is our CV and CP for two moles of neon? All you have to do is multiply the value per mole by the number of moles, right? So CP for two moles would be 2.00 mole times 20.78 joules per kelvin per mole. So for two moles, that's going to be 41.6 joules per kelvin. And what's our CV per mole? Oh, for two moles. Whatever our CV was, it was 12.47. So 2.00 moles times 12.47 joules per Kelvin <coughs> per mole. Okay. Is it time to go?